EV battery chemistry has just undergone a massive breakthrough, a paradigm shift, and the first 1000 mile battery is now already here. But I confidently predict it will never be made. I'm Dave, and this is Dave Takes It On. I do love those emails I get from CEOs and tech nerds who say, Dave, you might want to have a look at this, and they then send me a link to a specific bit of info. I recently got one from someone, I'm going to call him Fred, not his real name. I'm impressed with his credentials and position, and he said there is a fantastic battery revolution going on It's just about to hit EVs. Check out the Chinese mobile phone scene, and he sent me several links. Now, after basic security checks to make sure they were real links, I found out quite quickly the smartphones in the Western world, like iPhones and Samsung, all have lithium-ion batteries, mainly NMC with cobalt, expensive nasty stuff, child slave labour and all that, and nickel to provide the power they demand while keeping the size to an absolute minimum. But the Chinese batteries are not. They are almost exclusively lithium polymer or silicon carbon batteries, even quite budget phones, and that instantly got my attention. Then I started to check the specs. The iPhone 16 has a battery capacity of 3,561 milliamp hours. Don't, don't worry about terminology, worry about the numbers, because the Chinese phones, like the Honor 15 Lite, yeah, not the Ultra, but the Lite, has a capacity of 6,600 milliamp hours. That's about 60% more. That's a massive wow. But in the same section, I read that the iPhone, even the Pro, charges at 20 watts or 25 if you get a special charger, while the Honor Lite can charge at 66 watts. Hmm. Now, to be fair, I have assumed that the lithium polymer and silic silicon carbon are almost interchangeable terms because of the massive charging rate, which is nearly three times faster than the iPhone 16 Pro and the Samsung 25 Ultra with lithium iron. But also because their flagship model, the Honor 15 Ultra battery, is labelled lithium polymer and then in brackets, third generation silicon carbon battery. And that charges wirelessly at 80 kilowatts and plugged in at 100 kilowatts, and that is four times faster. And the Chinese Xiaomi smartphone is the same with silicon carbon batteries. They brand it surge batteries, 5,410 milliamp hours, and charging speeds 80 watts wireless and 90 watts wired. That's a world apart. It's up to 50% more capacity and up to four times faster charging speed. So do the Chinese know something we don't? Then when I start looking up the battery manufacturers, I get a shock. They're not just made in China, but also in America. Hmm. Well, the silicon carbon bits are the anodes. I'm going to explain exactly what those bits do shortly. There is group 14, for example, in Washington. I think that's Washington State, not Washington, D.C. They appear to be one of the world leaders in silicon technology. And Apple, it appears, are just way behind the curve. Well, behind the Chinese, anyhow. They're also featured on Bloomberg, Yahoo, Finance and MSNBC in, in connection with making the silicon anodes for EVs. Oh, we're back to EVs now. Then I find that Tesla has already been working on silicon carbon for several years and already has them working in some of their EVs. More on that a bit later too. I then find several other silicon carbon manufacturers like Storedot in Israel who are already supplying their silicon carbon anodes to EV maker Polestar to set a world record. More on that one later. And battery makers like Molicel, who operate in China, Taiwan and Canada, who make the final high-power batteries for the EV manufacturer McMurtry, with their Spearlink hypercar that recently set several world records with F1 driver or ex-driver Max Chilton at the Goodwood Festival of Speed. Wow, what a truly international cooperative world we really do live in these days, well, apart from America. 
Well, now firmly, feet firmly on the ground. Just take any EV with a WLTP range of about 400 mile that recharges 10% to 80% in about 20 minutes. There's plenty about Hyundai Ionic 5 and 6, Kia EV5 and 6, Tesla Model 3 and Y, Xpeng G6. Now chuck in a pack of the silicon carbide batteries and you could get a range of up to 600 miles and a charging time of under five minutes. And that easily beats 99% of all the petrol cars on the road today. And that is why nobody will ever build an EV with a thousand mile range. Well, let me explain. The petrol car was invented well over a hundred years ago and there's well over a billion that have been made. In all that time, the hundreds of different motor companies and factories have never ever made and sold a petrol or diesel car that can travel 1,000 miles on a tank full. Never. They could incredibly easily just slap in a fuel tank two or three times the size. It really is that simple. And the reason they never have in over 100 years? Well, three actually. First, you'd have no boot space left at all. The boot would just be one huge fuel tank and people would not buy a car without a boot. Second, a full tank of that size would weigh about the same as the car and your fuel economy would be about the same as a Challenger main battle tank. Third, I've saved the best for last, the cost of filling it up at today's prices right to the top would be about the same as your monthly salary and nobody in their right mind would wipe out their entire bank balance topping up their fuel tank. Now, the reason nobody has ever built a petrol or diesel car with a 1,000 mile range is we don't want one. What we want is four or five, maybe 600 miles of range and the ability to just stop and top up in five or 10 minutes whenever and wherever we want. Silicon carbon batteries just gave us exactly that. Up to 600 mile range charging in under five minutes. The likes of Tesla superchargers, Gridserve, Ionti, Fastnet, Osprey, amongst others, have already installed those chargers that can do it. Most motorway services now have multiple ultra-rapid chargers, 250 kilowatt, 350 kilowatt power and above, capable of doing exactly that. So now we need to look at the how, and for that we need to look at the batteries, the chemistry and charging curves. But don't worry, this will be a total idiot's guide, I promise you. For all you tech experts or battery chemists who want to correct me and send in 16 page highly technical chemical explanations, please don't, nobody wants them. This is the idiot's or the dummy's guide, it's about as simple as it gets. The modern rechargeable battery is made up essentially of two bits and a chemical the cathode, the anode, and the lithium electrolyte. The cathode is the bit that gives out the power. In the Gen 1 battery, it's NMC. That's nickel, manganese, and cobalt. In the Gen 2, it's LFP, lithium, iron, that's Fe iron, and phosphate. The cathode is like the powerhouse. Think of it like an engine, where you could have a two litre Lotus performance engine, which is more powerful than a two litre transit engine. Nothing to do with the size of the engine, more the way they're built. The anode is more like the power store. And in Gen 1 and 2, it's mainly graphite. Think of it a bit like a balloon. When you charge it up, the pressure builds up. Now, the bigger the store, the longer it can pr provide that pressure to run the powerhouse or the engine. So the ideal battery then will have the Lotus high performance engine for the cathode and a very large high pressure store for the anode, giving you great performance and a long duration or for an EV long range. But in the real world, there always has to be a compromise. If you want the Lotus performance, you get less space left for the anode, the storage. So you'd end up with shorter range and vice versa. Now you could just stick in a larger battery, of course, but that just adds extra weight. It adds extra cost that hits your performance and it increases the charging times. What's really needed is for someone to invent an anode, that's the store, that's very much smaller, that can store far more. So the powerhouse, the cathode, can then be much bigger. Now a lot of work has gone into the cathode recently and the power output has increased rather dramatically. 
much more like the Lotus engine these days. A lot less work has gone into the anode, well, at least until now. Enter silicon carbon. Now, in an average lithium-ion battery, they're roughly 50-50, cathode to anode, but with silicon carbon, that can now be increased to about 75% cathode, or engine, and about 25% anode, or store. So you get a bigger, more powerful engine, but with smaller store, and an even better range. And the hidden jewel in the crown with silicon is that, yeah, it can not only store far more, but it can also top it up 10 times quicker, so you get longer range and faster charging times. Too good to be true? Yeah, it is almost. See, one problem, and it has now quickly resolved, silicon can charge up to 10 times faster, but while it's charging, the silicon swells up to 10 times the size as it charges, and that caused the battery itself to swell up, potentially burst, not very good. So the simple answer was to build in some spaces into where the silicon is for it to be able to expand into. For this they used special form of carbon, sort of nanotubes, but they only installed the silicon into about a third of it. So then they only charged three to four times faster. Hey, that's pretty brilliant! And the swelling was now into the available space and totally under control. No burst batteries. Well, Tesla's already found this out and plenty of other problems too. They started using silicon carbon a few years ago and they're one of the front runners with their 4680 cells and they've actually got them working and they're already being installed in several of their EVs. They're not the only one though. Another is the previously mentioned McMurtry Spearling hypercar, but that's a one-off and in the world of mass production, all is not going quite so well. For Tesla, silicon carbon reject rate and factory remained stubbornly high, started out at 90% reject, <laughs> totally unacceptable figure, and while it is now very much lower, it's not yet finally ready for full mass production. They got four batteries on the go at the moment, the NC05, NC20, NC30 and NC50. The NC simply stands for new cell, the digits, they don't reveal it, but it's probably for the percentage of silicon. Anyone can build a one-off, but it's likely these will finally be in mass production at the end of this year, 2025 or early 2026, as they are actually in a race with the Chinese to be the first to launch EVs with all the benefits that silicon carbon offers. In this case, the winner is quite likely to take it all. It is a true game changer. Unfortunately, like Apple with their iPhone, the majority of legacy EV makers like Porsche, BMW, Mercedes, VW, Hyundai, Kia, they're all still using Gen 1 NMC cells, and they're going to find themselves dropping further behind Tesla and the Chinese. Meanwhile, the Zika 07, and that's still on NMC Gen 1, already has a charging time down at 16 minutes. Can you imagine what that would be like if they installed silicon carbon batteries? That probably would now be faster than filling up with petrol. Well, regarding the chargers, charging curves and maximum charging speeds, there's still some way to go. If you've got, say, a 70 kilowatt hour battery and you want to add 40 or 50 kilowatt hours, that's on the basis that you're never going to arrive with 0%. And with these batteries, there's no longer going to be any need to charge to 100% out on the road. Then a GridServe or Osprey or Fastned or Ionity 300, 350 kilowatt charger will be capable of providing that in about five, six and, well, no more than eight minutes. The limiting factor would normally be the EV's onboard BMS or battery management system and the charger cable and plug. Well, Polestar recently worked with Stordot, an Israeli-based company, also working at the cutting edge of silicon anode-based anode batteries. And they charged and filmed a prototype Polestar with a full-size battery. The exact size was not stated, but it's likely to be around about 70, 75 kilowatt hours. Charged from 10% to 80% in exactly 10 minutes, setting a world record. It is happening. This is not like solid state, which, like fusion, always seems to be several years away. And the consensus now is beginning to think that solid state might never actually arrive, but silicon carbon is actually here today. 
And once it hits mass production, there might actually be no place left or no need for solid state. Now, going from prototype to production, as Tesla found out, is not that easy. But these silicon carbon batteries are already on the road and already proven. It, it, it is a transition needed now, not a technical development or invention. And mass production has already happened with Chinese smartphone batteries. They're making millions of them. There is no need to totally reinvent the wheel. The hard work has been done. Unfortunately, the hard work has been done in total secrecy. Those that make the silicon batteries for Honor and Xiaomi, they're not exactly keen to share that secret with others. They like their monopoly and they would prefer to hang on to it for as long as possible. Who can blame them? But at least the others now know it is entirely possible to get into mass production. Ah, but the charging curve will stop all this speed, everyone will now tell me in the comments section. But unfortunately, the charging curve is a factor of the graphite anode in the Gen 1 and Gen 2 batteries. The battery chemistry simply cannot take any more power or go any faster. They would explode. Silicon can. It can take very much more and very much faster. Charging curves will be much more straight lines. Polestar proved that on a video. Watch it if you doubt it. That link to the video is down below. It happened. The problem now will be the likes of Instavolt, who still insist on installing most of their chargers rated at 100 kilowatts, although precious few do go up as high as about 160. With well, 100 kilowatts, even fitted with silicon carbine batteries, a 50 kilowatt hour charge is going to take at least half an hour. Now, for a rep on the road or a plumber or delivery driver, that will, in future, seem like a lifetime. It's also going to force some of the CPOs to upgrade their charger cables and plugs. I am well aware that many install cables that are not capable or rated at the full speed of the charger on the basis that, well, they're cheaper and most EVs will not be pulling the full rated charging speed anyway. Maybe also they'll need to upgrade the power that goes to the location. Again, many of them cut corners and costs and do not provide sufficient power to run all chargers at full power. Penny pinching. Well, Tesla superchargers already have plenty of power for all their locations and are already in line for a massive upgrade. Starting this year, all new installs will be the V4 chargers with the V4 cabinets rated at 500 kilowatts and up to a thousand volts. At 500 kilowatts for EVs that could make use of it, that would mean a charging session of nearer five minutes for that 40 to 50 kilowatt hour charge. And yes, I'm fully aware that none of their EVs, or anyone else's for that matter, can currently charge at that rate. And even the Lotus Emea or the Porsche Taycan, probably the fastest charging EVs in the UK at present, top out at about 350. It's going to be a while before any number of EVs from any manufacturers need more than silicon carbon can already provide. Maybe more will never be needed. Is less than five minutes worth paying extra for? I'm beginning to think not, this might be the limit. OK, well, I think that's enough facts and figures, apart from the most obvious, cost. Silicon's dirt cheap. It's basically sand. And carbon is cheap as well. It's basically any living thing, or anything that once lived but is now dead. And the tech is changing already, or more accurately, has already changed, but there is obviously a lag between it changing and us seeing it installed in the EVs that we buy. There is also a massive positive feed loop going on behind the scenes that will ensure the success of these silicon batteries and EVs. As the smartphone batteries in the rest of the world, like Apple and Samsung, switch to silicon carbon to catch up with China, so the cost will fall dramatically. And as the cost falls, there'll be an increase in demand for use in other applications like power tools and grid connected battery storage. That will further increase demand and make them even more attractive for use in EVs, lowering prices 
while increasing performance and range and reducing charging times, making them even more appealing, etc, etc, etc. Positive feedback loop. The future is bright. The future is silicon carbon. The battery nobody is talking about. I'm Dave.